Welcome to another episode of Dancing in the World, the podcast where we reveal cultural confluences in dance cultures around the world. And today we're here with our special guest, Pablo Regis de Oliveira, who is a Brazilian musician. We did a creative residency with Pablo. Um, this was actually the impetus for the work that Sinclair and I have been doing, and Pablo has been involved all the way, actually. Um, but we did a creative collaboration in, um, starting in 2019, we had a little bit of a delay because of COVID, but we finally performed in 2021. And it was a confluence of Nigerian and Brazilian music and dance, and then a little bit of Irish dance as well. Um, so we're really happy to have you on the podcast, Pablo. And we'd love to hear a little bit about your background. How did you get into Brazilian music? Well, first of all, thanks for having me here, Sinclair and Kate. Um, it, for me, I grew up in it. My dad was a Brazilian musician, performer, uh, cultural worker. So I grew up with the music, uh, family and friends, and it's always been, I've never actually studied formally a course in college and whatnot about music. It's always been something where I've learned in the circle of, of practitioners. Yeah. And we should also mention that you're half Peruvian as well. Yes. So you're, you have a mix of cultures. A confluence. Yeah. So I'm, by fa my father's from Bahia, Brazil. My mother's from Peru, Lima. And I grew up between Los Angeles and then grew up in Brasilia too, so grew up between both. And then so my dad worked internationally. We also were in other countries like Germany. And, and, and what kind of music do you play from Brazil? Oh, well, I play the cavaquinho, which is a Brazilian uh, tenor or Brazilian ukulele. And um, I play samba music, faha, some choro. So these are older traditional folk uh, genres. Great. And how we all came together at the the first episode of this podcast we talked about the samba pizza party which was really the impetus for this work and sinclair i remember that you you said that you walked in and felt something when you heard yeah. pablo playing yeah just walking in and seeing how it was a community of people who were just chilling and having fun and then Pablo started playing this solo. I was like, ooh, that's so cool. And then the way people were reacting, right? Like people were eating, you know, people were just hanging around and reacting to that. It felt like I was in Nigeria. And of course, I was missing home. <laughs> and so having that atmosphere just made me feel, oh, yeah, this is, I want to be here all the time. But then this was an event that didn't happen every week, right? So it's like, oh, how do I get more of this? And so I was looking at Pablo going, that's a point guy. I need to talk to him. But then I saw you, right? Yeah. 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 And that, I think it was like a week later that we all got together and had a conversation and decided that we were going, going to apply for this grant through the Next Look program, which is a program, a creative residency program funded by the University of Maryland's Clarice Smith Performing Arts Center and Joe's Movement Emporium in Mount Rainier, Maryland. And so we applied to this residency to see if we could get some funding and support to spend some time developing something. Yeah, I mean, what we felt at the pizza party and why we decided to kind of make, um, kind of create a community that is sustained in this type of practice was the same feeling we felt after the residency, right? Um, other people felt that way, thinking, oh, this should happen more of, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, Pablo, when we, mm. when we brought you in, we brought you in as the Brazilian music expert mm -hmm. and, and kind of the music expert mm -hmm. in general. And so what were some things that you were thinking about from your perspective as a Brazilian and also as a musician in terms of like building something that felt true to the like the samba events that you were used to curating and producing? Yeah. So, um, I, you know, it all started with the we got a call from Sinclair after the, the pizza party. Um, and uh, I think it started from there because it was an honest, genuine. It's always nice to get a compliment of like, hey, I really felt at home especially more so when you're coming from a different continent. And so I, I went from there, like, what are the common elements I felt that appealed to everyone? And, but at the same time, what were the authentic things in my music? So I'm not trying to go way beyond where I was. And in doing that, I think when we sat down and had conversations, I started learning also more about <clears throat> dance. And I think this is a unique thing about our project as opposed to some other other projects that, you know, dance and music is very tied in together. Yeah, yes. And I think in that very first event we had, 
at the at the pizza shop um it was it's all natural we don't ask people hey come come down no it's like like a performer you know someone is performing and the audience member will jump up and say something so it was all part of that so I, you know that's where i i came from a, a place of authenticity really or honesty let's say yeah yeah we wanted to re recreate that feeling of like not inviting people to dance but creating a scene where like people can't help but get up and dance yes. and sing along if they know the words and la 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 if they don't know yeah. the words and playing you know knives on plates which is a traditional instrument in mm -hmm. brazil um and so when we were th putting the residency together i mean we had we had over a year of conversations more than we expected because of covid canceling canceling us twice actually but when we finally got into this space you know we had to make so many decisions about who to invite in and just how we were going to approach um creating something that didn't need to have a final product at the end we just had to feel like we had we had made progress towards an idea that we had yeah i mean what was this idea the you know we um we like we said in previous episodes we've been we felt out of place we felt like we were not being accepted in the dance communities that we Kate and I were coming from, meaning the academic dance scene in Washington, D.C. And so this was kind of an opportunity to create an environment where we could see our performance, we could see our cultural selves being appreciated and just having fun for the first time, having a space where we could do that. But even more expansively, having a musician who was from another culture collaborating with us uh, was just amazing. And so um, this event was sort of a community event and we pulled from everything that we know. You know, even the name, the title is from Hausa and Brazil coming together, right, forming the title of the, the piece. Um, Which is Ainihi Yalteridade. Yeah, there we go. It's a long, <laughs> it's a long name. <laughs> but, it, you know, the idea literally was just to create um, a, a now we have the term confluence of these different cultures. Um, from my end, I brought in Hausa dance. I, I threw in some Benin Ugo dances and Sakbaide dances, um, do Rogo dances, Uje dance. I pulled in um, some Akoto and Bata dances from the Yoruba uh, peoples. And we invited my friend, um, another African dance professor from Gaucho, Mustafa Primo. Um, he brought in the Ghanaian dances as well. So we just had kind of that African dance, um, throwing it into this um, pool. Yeah, and similarly with me, I did the same thing, uh, working with what was available at the time. You know, I brought in the Brazilian element myself, but we had a good friend there, Steve, who was, you know, coming from the Cuban tradition, uh, but also has experience with African, and then also, Brazil has many aspects itself. So I brought in another Brazilian musician who comes more from the bossa nova world, which is a derivative form of samba, um, and making it all, all fit in. Yeah. And we had a jazz musician we as well. We had a well, jazz musician, yeah. Who played Afro beat, um, Afro beat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah right. and, and then from my perspective, I mean, honestly, at the beginning, we weren't talking about including Irish dance at all yes. because it felt like it needed to be a conversation between... Brazilian music and Nigerian dance and yeah. some Ghanaian dance as well. But I remember that at one point you all were playing some percussion in, in six eight, which is a jig in, in Irish dance. And um, it just felt like that would be a fun thing to throw in as, you know, part of the confluences. And I invited my good friend, Emily Olson to also participate. And she's, you know, an Irish dancer and percussive dancer um, who has a lot of experience in many different forms as well. So we did a lot of curating of, artists to bring in the people that we knew understood the conversation that we were having at, on some level, whether or not it was explicit or not, and then knowing that they would appreciate this kind of collaboration. Yeah, I mean, one thing that we were even thinking of, another thing we thought about actually was what will this feel like if this was a food with different type of spices, what will it taste like? We didn't know. I mean, uh, even we had a five-day residency mm -hmm. or six mm -hmm. days. Um, even at the fifth day when we were there for the final showing, as it was, um, 
we didn't know what it would look like, mm -hmm. sound like even, right? <laughs> and that, and that is what our, m most of our cult social cultural um, performances are. You wake up, you they say, oh, this is going to be the event, and you dress up, you know, to meet people, to eat good food, and then you just see different performances happening, and then you are entertained, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think like what you explore in the book, you know, the way our our system is here, especially in this region, they weren't even prepared really for this type of performance. Right. Um, I think this app uh, was able to adapt to a new style of, of of engaging with the audience, which is what we were proposing, and um, that was that was a an, an exciting challenge for us. I think I think that we had was really like because having an event like this come together involves so many different aspects. You know, whether it was the first one that we saw each other, it was at a pizza place, yeah. and this is even at an arts location, and they all have you know the people who are there are used to something else, mm -hmm. and we're bringing in this new concept. I think is was exciting for, for me. Yeah. We had a lot of ideas about bringing in food and making it much more of a social event. Because of COVID, we couldn't do all of the things that we wanted to do. Um, but in the end, I mean, we had a five-day residency at Joe's Movement Emporium, and we had, you know, the first four days were in the studio for four or five hours, I yeah. think, per day, um, where we were just exploring and it really did feel exploratory and it didn't mm -hmm. feel like we had pressure to create something yeah. and f the friday the last day of the residency was supposed to be it could have been you know we were told that it could be anything it could be a showing it could be a performance it could be a social gathering and we definitely went in the direction of like a social gathering where we knew that we wanted to invite certain people, again, other people that would appreciate the work that we were doing and would know how to respond in a situation like this. So that last day was, you know, everybody coming together. We had like prepared some dances. You and Mustafa had yes. had kind of loosely choreographed some things and I was just following along and... Um, you all had a, a set list of music that you yeah, had prepared. Yeah, we were, really were able to work with live, depending on what was happening, yeah. Yeah, and then on the day of, it was like, we just, it was like go time, and there was, the cool thing was, there was no, like, three, two, one action. And, 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 yeah. It was like, okay, we're all here, it's around 7 o'clock, 7.30, are we going to get started? Like, we were all wandering around, the musicians were kind of warming up. And the audience, the audience was entering and also kind of either sitting if they thought it was a performance or also wandering around. Mm. And um, it made for kind of like a, it was an interesting, for me, I was, I felt pulled in either direction. Like mm. I wanted to be like, we need to show that we know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. But also, this is, this is just chill. Yeah, I think one of the things I learned from that was the, the feedback from the audience that we sat down afterwards to talk, the dancers and the musicians, the performers, everyone was that everyone exci was excited about it. And I would have, I, we need to repeat it again, you know, do another iteration because that's what makes it more, um, what helps further develop it, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's what the book that we ended up writing was like. You know, um, I think the writing process just pulled in all these different ideas, different cultures, and cultural experiences that we've had. Um, and we thought about it more specifically as to how do we create space for our community. And, and space in itself, in our idea, is very multiplistic, if you will, because we're thinking about physical space. We're also thinking about the body space. We're also thinking about the musical space. You know, um, what are all these spaces and how do people experience these spaces? Um, it made sense for us to create a space for that to happen. Um, we were tired of being invited into spaces that were not structured for us and having us go in there and begin to struggle to fit in. Um, and a musician told us um, at the end of this residency saying, people need to experience this type of performances more. And that resonated with me. It wasn't because what we've done is special, but because what we've done is really replicating what happens in our communities. Yeah. Here and and 
and for some reason it felt like immigrants gather <laughs> and this is what we do right um which also secludes us you know yeah. kind of sadly um, but i think once we begin to do it more once we have written a book once we are doing a podcast where people can contribute to once we begin to put up more events people will begin to buy into mm -hmm. it right mm -hmm. um is that a cultural um curatorial curatorial re-education there we go we're calling it. there we go <laughs> curatorial re-education of the washington dc population uh, people will get to understand how to be in this performance, how to get it, um, mm. and then how to buy into it, you know? Yeah. There were some things we did that were jarring. For example, yeah. the, the giving audience money when they come in at the door, instead of them paying us, we gave them $10, right, to go <laughs> see the show. It was a little bit off the And other. we did that because yeah, we, that's... Yeah. That's what happens in Nigeria where I come from. People go to an event and they come back with gifts and presents, right? Um, it's not something that is new, it's, but in America, I think that is weird <laughs> if it happens. Yeah, so I think people were pleasantly surprised. Normally, yeah. they get charged to the door and here we are. Okay, here's $10, like, nothing major, but yeah. they got something. But yeah, I think we'll take a short break and during the break we'll show some footage from the collaboration yeah. and the residency, the gathering that we did, and then we'll come back and talk about the responses that we got yeah. to the work. <laughs> back with the episode with our guest with Pablo Hegis. And, um, you know, in the previous uh, section of the episode, we were talking about this idea of curatorial re-education. Re and did it work? Did people get it, I think is the question. We invited people that we knew would get it. And then there were other people that came, you know, this was a public showing. Um, and we did a Q&A discussion at the end of the work. And... Um, what what did you guys take away from it? Um, well, I think people did get it. I mean, we got really positive um, response to it, but there were many insi uh, insightful response, meaning that it wasn't good or bad. It was just some people had a reflective moment where they were like, wow, these people are just having fun. I feel like I'm not having fun like they're doing. That that means, like I'm a, I'm kind of alienated from this whole fun, um, and we don't want that, right? We wanted it to be so that wasn't quite positive, but something to think about. Thinking if we are trying to make space for our work, um, how do we make that space without alienating every other people? Yeah. So that's something I was I've been thinking about more recently. But they were positive. Um, feedback that we feedback, and we can talk about that later. Yeah, yeah. I think um, you know we we were barraged by COVID, so that made a lot of difficulties on on many ends. But um, the lack of being able to find funding consistently to do this type of work, we have to always go look for, for other organizations who sometimes are not really familiar with the concept of what we're trying to 
to provide. So that that is, I think, a difficulty. When you finally get it, you got to rush and put everything together and go do it. So that you know, lack of resources really is is a big one too. Yeah, yeah. and to kind of intellectualize like why we need funding. And for me, I just remember, I remember the energy in the space at the end of that gathering, and feeling a little bit like, wow, what did we just do? Like, we didn't really have a plan, but we did. You know, we planned to let it develop organically and it worked and people that did participate had a great time. I wasn't sure what the people who just sat in the back were feeling, um, whether they were like, "This, what's happening, what's going on? Or if they were like, wow, this is interesting. But I do remember the comments of people who said, wow, I've never been to something like this before. I didn't know that I could dance. Because we just invited people. We had yeah, this little choreography sure. plan, <laughs> but we didn't know if people were going to join us, and they did. And people were exhilarated by that. And that felt really good. You know, I, there were multiple people that just felt... We had to actually stop the conversation, remember, because it was taking so long. Everyone wanted to say something mm -hmm. about how good they felt at the end of it. So... That to me meant something because it wasn't just people that come from Brazilian culture or Nigerian culture. It was people that didn't necessarily have any experience with this music or dance before, but somehow felt included, you know? Yeah. Um, so that, <clears throat> that was the positive side of it for me. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that struck me was looking at dancers, you know, modern dancers who in our community, we dance together at the studios, um, them coming into this experience and going, oh my God, this is different. You have so much like rhythm and they had so much to say about it positively. That for me was, that meant a lot because we had bought, we got ourselves new type of audience, like mm -hmm. more, I'll say more critical audience who would come in and be like, well, that is good, you know, and mm -hmm. we got that and so, um, the other thing that you know I kept going back to was this whole idea of creating performance and what intention is. Even during the dancing, what part of it at some point felt like in our bodies go, we need to perform now for people. Mm -hmm. And people saw those aspects and go, oh, Sinclair, that, well, that duet was good, you know, but then I had to do this with you, I felt good, you know. And that was positive for me, knowing that that resonated with some people. That was great. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And then we got some nice feedback from the musicians as well. Like mm -hmm. yeah. um, the one who said that, which you said in the previous half of the episode, said that there should be more events like this for people to participate in. But he also said that he wanted more events like that for musicians to participate mm. in because I think there's, there's a well-known issue in so many traditions, I know in Irish dance at least, separation of music and dance that was not initially separate, right? So this idea that musicians understanding what dancers do, I think it's more common, in my experience at least, for dancers to be around musicians because mm -hmm. we need them, but musicians this day and age often don't necessarily have dancers. Yeah. So I thought that was a really cool piece of feedback to get as well. Yeah, and the I felt like also my general impression for musicians was like, um, being given the opportunity to really explore during the performance, you know, so we brought together Brazilian, different types of Brazilian, Cuban, American, and, you know, we all had music and stuff we could go on, but like really being able to engage with each other in a creative way and then the dancing audience and the public who was also participating actively, that I felt like that was, a, I could see the brightness in people's eyes when we were performing, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> And then we got some not so great feedback as well. Yes. Um, I will say this came like after the event, so it didn't happen, you know, during the post event talk. But you know, we we were told by a, a prominent arts leader in in the community that came to the event that it seemed like just an improvisational jam. And an improvisational jam in itself isn't that bad, but the word just you know, really diminishes, I think, what we did and who who we are, what we bring into the space with, you know, a collective. How old are we? We, we won't count the years, but we have a lot of years of experience between us mm -hmm. in our respective forms. And to be told that it was just 
improvisational, which we talk about in the next episode. <laughs> We're going to talk about um, improvisation and kind of the racialization of that term. Um, and also, you and know, that, that a lack of what was awareness. our process. Yeah, or even like taking consideration like what we were actually all three of us bringing. And each, all three of us were also bringing other people involved with other cultures. Like I think there was a lack of understanding like, um, I don't want to say innovative, but how challenging it was and how they were able to bridge all these cultures together to create something new. I think that was also, the comment was a little dismissive of all of that. Yeah, the, there's a people aspect to this that, you know, the curation involved curating people in the space. It it was the artistry that we have, the background that we have as technicians, as artists, but also that we knew who to bring into the space to make it work. Well, I think when we when we we did apply for a grant and mm -hmm. we got the grant. And one thing that happens, especially in America, which is a democracy, is that you apply for grants and you compete with other people for this grant. And when they give a collection of people grants, they set up a kind of a competition, right, to see whose usage of that grant was worth it. Um, and so we were up against a lot of mainstream artists that their works are already known. Uh, and accepted as a norm for for why that grant was given and what they were going to produce would be absolutely what they wanted to fund. Um, and then we showed up <laughs> with um, this idea of space and everybody just dancing and, you know, Brazil, Nigeria put together and invite people to just explore it would confuse people, especially people who are giving you money. And we know that, but what they were not taking into account um, was this idea that we were not just having fun, we were creating a space, not just intellectual space, but a cultural space where our people who have been um, excluded for so long can find um, a place to be happy and be their cultural self, um, they didn't take into account that with that grant opportunity, open, op opportunity opened the door for us writing a book, um, thinking about producing a documentary, um, thinking about different cultural events that has happened through that grant that has reached out to hundreds and hundreds of people at this point. Um, and I don't think that, not comparing our process with other mainstream artist um, processes, but I don't think that anyone would have done so much with such little <laughs> amount of grants, you know, given. And we've, you know, we've put in time, and at this point, years, just developing ideas, working every day, every night, um, just because we know that we felt something so strong, and we know that we can build on that and we're doing the work to do that. So every positive comment that we've got, every negative comment just only um, fuels us to want to do more. Yeah, the, the collaboration <clears throat> was absolutely a research experiment, right? Yes. And so getting negative feedback was also, it was expected. Good, yeah. Remember, we talked a lot yeah. about like, you know, we what, knew we were gonna get we know what we're going to hear. <laughs> and so we knew it was going to happen. But as we were like also thinking through the book, because we'd already started writing books by the time we actually Correct, did the residency, yes. and it was like, are we making this up? You know, <laughs> like, are our memories faulty? So to actually put something into practice together, put it out there, put it on stage, and elicit feedback was yeah. like, oh yeah, that, that's absolutely <laughs> the yeah. kind of feedback that we get. So it was a research experiment, mm -hmm. and we created the scenario to get all kinds of feedback in that mm -hmm. way. Yeah, and I'll say, you know, we haven't done this in isolation. Um, I know we may have sound like we're complaining, but we've got two major grants after that that supported both the book writing and, uh, you know, the producing podcast, um, which we would get even, we're planning to do more, of, you know, to get more product out there. And so it's not like we've just said, oh, that was one time thing and, 
people have actually supported us. A lot of reviewers have <coughs> thought that what we're doing is great, and we know that we want to reach more people. Um, and you listening, um, we want to reach you to come see the performance anytime we put anyone up or any product that we put out. Mm -hmm. Pablo's music is out there, uh, and we're writing a book. You know, we want us to have more conversation. And also, dancers who are performers who are feeling so marginalized and um, excluded from the community can have a place to. Um, come and voice out their frustration <laughs> or even dance with us. Yeah. Yeah, I mean there there's so much that we're that we're doing and as a team, I mean Sinclair and I have written the book and have done the podcast, but Pablo has also been an important collaborator through all of this. Um, and we are going to do more yeah. performances, mm -hmm. collaborations, projects. Um, yeah, projects. the book launch party which should be coming <laughs> soon. It's going to be a recreation without all of the COVID, you know, limitations. So it's been great to have you on the episode, Pablo. Thank you for coming up here to talk with us. Well, it's been my pleasure. It's, it's always great to collaborate with you, and I look forward to us doing, doing more. So everyone stay tuned for the next few projects. Thank you, Pablo.